kindness is magical because it doesn't just make the person that receives the act of kindness have a lift, right, and, and have a better day. It also makes the person doing the kind act feel better about themselves. You feel good. You feel good when you do something nice for a human being. So that's uh, what I think my team uh, talks about when they say that they feel that kind make, makes them better people, that we're constantly striving to be ambassadors of kindness. And everybody makes mistakes, but it's, it's an aspiration. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome to Ford this week, one of the world's greatest entrepreneurs, and that is no exaggeration. You know him as the founder of Kind Snacks, Daniel Lubetsky joins us. Daniel, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. So great to be here with you. Yeah, so Daniel, people who follow me know that I'm an avid fan and consumer of Kind Snacks. I've got a little bit of a proof point right here in my hands, the uh, cranberry almond variety. But you and I have been friends for years. We met in the White House in 2015. And the story I tell is that we're there for an hour or so. Uh, we're all kind of waiting for the president. And then you say, hey, is anyone hungry? And we are all famished. So people say yes. And then you open your jacket pockets and they're replete with kind bars of different flavors. And so you just start distributing them. And I joke that you're like the Batman of snacks. And I still remember this in part because they weren't even normal kind bars. They were like prototypes of different flavors I have never seen since then. <laughs> you know, uh, Andrew, the other part that you may or may not remember is that then we went into the Oval Office where we were named Presidential Ambassadors for Global Entrepreneurship. President Obama joked, you know, did you not bring any kind bars for me? And I didn't know how to respond. I said, well, I do have some if you'd like. And he said, go ahead. And I ran for my backpack and I ran back and the White House looped it in. They actually in their video showed me running like the most pathetic runner in the world. Like, because A, I don't know how to run, but B, it was like fast looped. So it looked like- Oh, they just, sped you up. <laughs> yeah, but I, I looked so silly, but I literally brought, um, Kind bars to the president, which of course breaks all protocols because you're not supposed to bring food to the head of state. But he asked for them, and uh, apparently he mentioned that they have them in what do you call it? Marine One is that what it's called? Sure, and, Marine One. Yeah. And I didn't know what Marine One is. I thought it was a, a, a submarine, but it's apparently their helicopter. They have yeah. Air Force One and Marine One. So people love kind snacks. Uh, they see them everywhere. Um, but I want to retrace your steps a little bit because everyone always wants to know how an entrepreneur uh, can get their start. So you grew up in Mexico and then in San Antonio, Texas. And I think one of your earliest entrepreneurial experiences was, was running a watch kiosk in the local mall in San Antonio, uh, which well, is- you're being very you're being very generous when you say in the local mall. That was once I had made it big and I was in college. But when I was in high school, I immigrated from Mexico when I was 16 and I couldn't hold any job as an employee because I didn't have a, a legal permit. We were there legally because my dad had a business, so he had the right to bring us as a family, but I didn't have a right to work. So I created my own business, which is part of what happens with a lot of immigrants. We're forced to start businesses because we're not legally allowed to be employed. But I used to I used to start in flea markets and drive for two hours and sell all sorts of gadgets and watches in the most fascinating uh, environments in the outskirts of San Antonio, like an hour away or so. And then I graduated to a network of student sales called Daleki Brands, uh, Daleki uh, Times. And then I had a couple of kiosks and shopping malls in um, across San Antonio, Texas, and all college students manned those and a lot of fun, crazy experiences. Well, you must have felt like you made it when you made it to the mall, huh? <laughs> it was it was like the fancy thing, the cutting a kiosk there compared to survival of the fittest at the uh, at the flea market. But the flea market teaches you so many fascinating skills too, including how not to eat an entire turkey leg. <laughs> <laughs> 
my brother would join me and you know it was thanks to my dad that we got started because he was in the watch business and he gave us a hand and so you went to college in san antonio uh, trinity university yeah and, and so you kept up with that business for quite some time through your college years uh you you then went to school in the bay area I felt like that must have been a real shift for you, uh, like going from uh, Mexico and San Antonio uh, to, to the Bay Area. And, but you didn't stay there that long. I think after that, you came east. Uh, did it you was ever... a huge shift. It's, yeah. uh, nobody's ever asked me this question, but it was really an incredible world shift. Mexico to Texas was a, because all, Mexico, I came from a very homogenous Jewish school, private Jewish school. And in San Antonio, I went to public high school at Robert Lee High School back then. That's what it was called. And it was uh, it was quite an experience. I don't think we have time to, to go over it, but it was fascinating, but I enjoyed it a lot. And then moving to, I went to Stanford Law School, but being in the Bay Area, it completely opened my mind to ways of thinking and being more, much more respectful and tolerant and in in many ways your question Andrew traces who I am because I was in such many different environments and it taught me to respect the way of thinking in Texas as well as California and try to build bridges between those and respect that people might have differences and they're not you know evil just because they have differences of perspective. Yeah I mean you you took that bridge building uh, approach all the way back across the world to the Middle East. Uh, you did a fellowship and then spent years uh, trying to connect the Israeli and Palestinian communities politically and entrepreneurially, which strikes me as like a monumental challenge. A and uh, it seems like that actually led you to food somehow. Is that right? Yeah, but what's interesting about your question is how little I knew and hence how lucky I was because had I known how hard what I was undertaking was going to turn out to be I maybe would have not had the courage to do it and a lot of times for any young listeners of yours that in a sense uh, actually is a blessing because maybe you'll make more mistakes but you'll do things that are meant to be done but that others that know no better quote-unquote wouldn't do and so I first started a company called PeaceWorks bringing neighbors Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians, Turks to trade with one another using business as a force for bringing together. And the concept, the mission was so important to me that I just kept with it for 10 years, even though it was, it was definitely uh, a challenge. And then you were alluding to something called the One Voice Movement that I built uh, as one of the builders with a lot of Israeli and Palestinian partners. But here was this confused Mexican Jewish American going into the Gaza Strip and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and staying up till 1 a.m. negotiating with Palestinians and Israelis on how to build this movement, which became one of the largest grassroots movements in the Middle East and certainly in, in the Palestinian and Israeli cities where it operates, which to this day is a voice for moderates to amplify their voices. From PeaceWorks and One Voice came Kind and Starts With Us, which are the core things I do now. Yeah, so Kind gets started uh, 2003, 2004, uh, and it is born of the fact that you're on the road all the time and you're like, what am I going to eat that doesn't make me fat and out of shape very quick? <laughs> which, by the way, is something I can totally relate to. Um, so I'm going to share for a moment. Uh, on the presidential trail, you would eat crap all the time. And so I would go to rest stops. Uh, and then uh, the temptation is to grab junk food. Um, but I, I kept, so you, this is a true story. I would go in and I would immediately be like, do they have Kind bars in this rest stop? And Kind has been one of the fastest growing food companies in, in the world over the last number of years. But I will say that, you know, rest stops in Iowa, it was not, <laughs> it was not <laughs> like, not carried very often. And so like, I, I would find myself um, you know, trying to find some some some. Taking a note, you didn't find story. kind bars in rest stops in Iowa. I'm going to work on that right away. So the company gets started uh, 18 years ago, and now it's ubiquitous. Now everyone sees it. Um, but you started in part because you you think that there is a real need for healthier food. Yeah, I mean, like you were saying, Andrew, I was uh, crisscrossing the United States uh, as well as setting ventures for PeaceWorks ventures all over the world. And skipping lunch or dinner while, you know, going on my tracks to try to get kind bars in different stores or traveling or just working in my desk and just wanting a healthy snack. And back in the, you know, 
mid 90s, even early 2000s, snack options were nothing remotely close to what we have today. There was just nothing that led with nutrient rich ingredients. Even today, by the way, where we are the number one healthy snack uh, in the United States and probably in the world, it's fascinating that the number of foods, snack foods, packaged foods that lead with a nutrient dense ingredient is it's very, very small. The vast majority of packaged foods lead with an empty calorie or like, you know, just a filler or just like sugar or refined flours that lack, you know, nutri uh, nutrient density. And it's part of the problem with obesity and diabetes in America that we're, you know, these things like sugar and refined flours cost 10 to 20 X less than a nutrient dense ingredient, like whole grains, whole almonds, tree nuts and stuff like that. So it's understandable that large companies oscillate to make products that are really devoid of healthful uh, ingredients. But then consequently, we pay for it at, at the hospital. With, we have one of the most, it's fascinating because the United States, you look at the data, we are extraordinarily strong on fighting infectious diseases, you know, with COVID being <laughs> maybe one of the daunting tasks of the last several years. But overall, over the last 50 years, we've just done a great job as a nation in fighting infectious diseases, but inflammatory diseases are just growing and growing and growing. Heart disease, uh, diabetes, and all sorts of ailments that are connected to our lifestyle. And we just need to do better as a nation. You mean to say that companies are somehow cutting nutritional corners uh, to make an extra buck, Daniel. I'm shocked, shocked. I'm sure everyone listening to this also. <laughs> I mean, it's unfortunate. We all know that, like, sure, it's probably cheaper to produce an unhealthy snack. No, it absolutely, it, and it's not, it's not like evil CEOs are sitting there and doing the things, how do we do? It's just, they're looking at the numbers. They're looking at like, hey, how do we make money? And Kine is very lucky that most people didn't go the hard path, right? They, they go through the easy path, and, but it is hard for companies because, Using nutrient dense ingredients means that the products cost more and you have to charge a little bit more for or significantly more. And some people can't afford them. And certainly brands might not be able to command that price power to charge what you need to charge for products made with nutrient dense ingredients. But it's also an agricultural policy issue because we subsidize sugar and empty calorie type monocrops and we don't do enough to support farmers that are trying to just eke by and survive making uh, more diverse crops that are more helpful. So it's, it's a big uh, policy challenge. What are you sleeping on right now? Seriously, I want you to think about it because I used to not give any time or thought to my mattress and then I got a Helix mattress and I'm telling you this it's freaking remarkable. Helix mattresses, some of the most comfortable mattresses on the market, and they're fantastic. So how it works is Helix Sleep has a quiz that just takes about two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. So why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? Get one made for you. And with Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be the perfect way for you to sleep. Everybody's unique. Helix knows that. So there's lots of different mattresses and models to choose from. So I got one that's like, medium firmness because I sleep on my side all the time. It's perfect for me. Cannot complain. And my brother who's just casually sleeping over loves it as well. This mattress is freaking gold. But you don't have to take my word for it. It's been awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. All you have to do is go to helixsleep.com slash yang. Take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life for real. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. So Helix right now is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows, and they're lovely, for our listeners. That's helixsleep.com slash yang, helixsleep.com slash yang. For me and for your audience, anybody that's starting out and that are younger and that are following, so I know your following is amazing, but it, it includes a lot of young people. You never know until you look back how fascinating all the connectivity in your life is. But 
Kind would not exist today were it not for PeaceWorks. And specifically, Kind would have not been so successful were it not for the mistakes that I made at PeaceWorks. And so it's okay when you're starting something to make mistakes. You and I, Andrew, have been friends through many turns. And what I love about you too is that you make a mistake, but you learn from it and then you absorb and then you become stronger. And so one of the things that I love about your presidential campaign that it's just not sufficiently commented on is the MATH, which was, I'm like, why does he want to encourage math? And Jesus just, you know, reaffirming that Asian stereotype that Asians like math, but no, it was much deeper than that. It was make Americans think harder. That's at its essence, what we need to do more of in our country. I go back thinking to your make Americans think harder thing, because if we're more introspective, our failures are gonna make us stronger. If we are more curious and more comfortable listening to the other side, we're actually gonna be stronger in advancing our causes. Make Americans think harder is literally what our nation needs the most of. And by the way, why have you not emphasized that just as much? Why did you move on from it? Because I really think it was genius. Who came up with that? Did you come up with that? Or did somebody else give it to you? Uh, so what happened was uh, I was doing an early presidential talk, very early, it's like early 2018, here in New York to uh, some entrepreneur friends in New York. Uh, and then one of them said, uh, Andrew, you know why you're going to do well is that the pendulum tends to swing in opposites politically. Uh, and so right now we have Donald Trump. And then the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian guy who likes math. And I heard that and I said, like, ah, that's funny. There's some truth to it. Um, and so I started using it in speeches and uh, i remember that line a lot but but that preceded math yeah so i used that in some speeches and it got applause no 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 but i, I i'm curious if you don't mind because it's fascinating it's one of the smartest models that have come up and we don't sufficiently appreciate it from an asian guy who likes math to math who came up with that that was like reverse engineering you realize that math was sexy for you, and then you came up with MATH? Yeah, so someone online uh, on a Reddit forum, I believe, said like math is an acronym, it stands for make Americans think harder. We should find that person because it's a really, I wonder where they got that, but it's really cool that you absorbed it because, but had you thought before about how essential that is in American society or it was just a coincidence? Well, uh, it, it was something of a counterpoint to make America great again, MAGA. And so one of the reasons why Trump is so effective is that, um, that there were such strong symbols and images and uh, tribalism and, uh, and thought, well, we should have a positive version of that. And, you know, it happened to have four letters as well. So the blue math, math hat, uh, we sold several million dollars worth of them uh, plus. Um, so it, it became this major campaign symbol. But I will say we did kind of stumble onto it. Well, I think you should do more with uh, Make America Think Harder and your forward party, which is really cool, could uh, integrate that because I really think about it a lot. A lot of what's happening to our nation is we're losing that curiosity gene, that self-reflection skill set and muscle that made us the most amazing nation on earth. And that hurts not just civilization, that hurts not just you being a better parent, that hurts you being a better entrepreneur, because how are you going to have and drive creativity if we are scared to debate and to listen to one another and to learn from one another? One thing that people always enjoy, Daniel, and I'm sure you've got them, is those entrepreneurial war stories where you're like, this is like a pivotal moment in the, the company's history. Uh, I'm sure you have that with Kind. I know one thing that happened with Kind is that people started seeing you and saying like, ooh, like, let's try and uh, buy your company or bring you in, um, and that you started getting offers for kind uh, years and years ago, where people were, and and so some people would look at you and say like, hey, you should take that offer. Um, I, I don't know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if um, if there are, are were key moments in kind's history that you reflect on fondly. Well, all the time. I mean, it, and also us entrepreneurs and people that are older than fifty start like getting a little bit too enamored with our nostalgic moments. So I love thinking back and reminiscing. And I, I really try to be very self-reflective, not just about the great moments, but even more about the things that went wrong because those, that's where the lessons are. That's where you can learn. But for me, what's fascinating is how kind started. It started 
the toughest year of my life because I had just lost my father. And so my dad was like, my mom and my dad are so important to me in my life. My dad was my role model and my hero. 2003 was a very, very tough year. I was st starting and launching the One Voice movement because it was one of the toughest moments in the uh, violence between Palestinians and Israelis. There was just so much division, so much polarization. Sadly, very reminiscent of what I see happening in America today, which terrifies me. And it's for me the impetus for some of the work I'm doing. But as someone that really cared about resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict since I was a kid, I was very, very focused on that. And then my dad passed away and I was in the midst of trying to launch KIND, what became KIND, but back then we didn't have a name for it. We named it KIND partly in honor of my father, who in spite of surviving the Holocaust and being in a concentration camp and being treated as a subhuman, you know, not even, not even as an animal, but as a sub-living species, he... He approached life with kindness towards all, and, and, and I was very grateful for everything. And we sat around the table, my team and I, and almost didn't launch Kind because I had a business setback with a product line that I was importing that had just lost all of its distribution. And so I had put all of my earnings into this line that we were importing. And then the manufacturer that we didn't control the manufacturing back then had changed the ingredients and added artificial ingredients. So we were forced to tell the natural trade about it. And as a result, we lost basically all of our business overnight. So I was with seven team members sitting down uh, in our little office. And I said, guys, should we throw in the tile? Remember, I had already been doing this for 10 years. And fortunately, we decided to give it a shot. But it's fascinating that kind of almost never saw the light of day. We almost didn't launch. The genesis of kind was one of the darkest years of my life and one of the darkest moments. And I literally was almost hoping that my team members just said like, yeah, let's just go do something else. And they would give me permission to go find a job somewhere. But I also, it wasn't just about my future, it was my team members future. And they encouraged me to um, fight and, I, and, and we, you know, then the rest is history. What was your personal life like uh, at that point? Had you met your now wife when you were making this decision to launch what became No, kind? no, 2003. When my dad passed away, it was a very tough time. I had a, I had broken up recently with a girlfriend. She was very nice to me after that. But, but it was a very tough year. It was really, really hard. And no, I didn't have, I hadn't met Michelle. I met Michelle three and a half years later. Well, for people who are going through tough times, uh, you know, I think this is a, a great story and outlook that incredible things can come out of dark periods. And I've seen that in other instances. I actually... Uh, one truth is that the best businesses are started in recessions. Uh, so if we end up in a recession and you, you're trying to start something, you should know, uh, you know, it, it, it may turn out to be very, very successful. Uh, how long did it take for Kind to hit its stride after you made the decision to, uh, to start it with the team? Kind took off overnight. I mean, it just, it was like my first 10 years at PeaceWorks, it was Two steps forward, two steps back. Two steps forward, two steps back. Like it was very, very, very tough. I never broke three million dollars or two and a half million dollars in revenues at PeaceWorks. Kind doubled every year, every year for ten years. And you know the law of community. You know, oh, yeah, that that adds it, up quick. You can start up quickly. So kind was really, really great in in that. And because of what I said earlier, Andrew, all the mistakes we made at PeaceWorks were we weren't obsessive about strategy. We were not obsessive about quality control. Like at Kind, we were obsessive about really keeping the brand guardrails. The reason why Kind took off is we were very true to the brand. We were very, very, okay, this is what the brand stands for, and we're not going to deviate. And if our brokers want us to launch another product because this is doing all, or we could just, you no, know, unless it, the quality is right and the brand proposition is met, till today, we're very obsessive about trying to really uh, keep the Kind promise. The, the, the mistake I made at Kind is, because of my 10 years at PeaceWorks where I was just barely surviving. I mean, at PeaceWorks, just to make sure that your audience understands, my salary 10 years after graduating from law school was $24,000 a year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I couldn't cover the pay loads myself that. sometimes. I, I sometimes couldn't pay myself. And I had to skip and I barely made payroll for my team sometimes. I wasn't like suffering like other amazing American citizens who are literally 
not able to pay for the healthcare for the children. I had my parents backing. So I knew that if I really struggled, I could have called my dad and my mom and they would be there for me. But still, I wanted to do it on my own. And it was very, very tough. I mean, I literally would just buy a falafel, gigantic, and then split it over three courses so that one meal could last me. You know, I, I did try to you know, make ends meet and, and, and only have one meal a day that would last me a couple. So I, I did um, maybe maybe self-enforced because again, if I had called my mom and dad and said, look guys, I need, you know, a thousand dollars, they would have been there for me. But because Peace Rooks had barely survived, I had taught myself the wrong lesson. Instead of being, you know, there's three cultures in bu- building a business. There is the frugality mentality, which is the one that I adopted at PeaceWorks, where every dollar is seen as a cost. And the good thing about it is that you make, you stretch every dollar. But the bad thing about it is you don't invest when you should invest. In the opposite corner or the opposite side of the spectrum of the frugality mentality is the wasteful mentality, which sadly exists a lot in today where young entrepreneurs just spend, 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 and they think that they're going to eventually have I, I don't up. think they call it the the waste approach. I think they call it the growth oriented approach. But continue. <laughs> right. That's the euphemism. Of, the euphemism for it is is the growth approach. That's a great point. I'm gonna uh, highlight that. That's how they call it. But for me, it's wasteful. They're, you're not respecting money, and you're just spending, spending, spending. And you know, this is why we work had people paying in thousands of dollars for a desk that they could have gotten for five hundred dollars if they had gone down to the basement, as I did. My first office was in the basement of the studio apartment that I rented and it was $500 a month, but you had to go through the laundry laundromat and the trash compactor. And it was a windowless basement and you could smell the trash compactor's odors oozing from under the, but but that's where I started. Not not, not having a lot of meetings in there, huh, Daniel? (laughs) Yes, I tried not to have any business meetings there. So there's a third approach between the frugality and where- Yes, thank you. The third approach is the resourceful mentality, um, which I only learned a few years into Kind. Like initially at Kind, I saw everything as an expense. So anybody that would try a Kind bar would fall in love with it. And nine out of 10 people not only would buy again, but would recommend it to friends. The data was insane, Like, but I didn't know better. So I, I treated sampling as a cost our budget for sampling was $800. <laughs> and the $800 was samples to send to the buyers, not to consumers. We didn't spend $1 giving free product because we saw that as an expense. Like if you want it, go and buy it. And when we finally brought in an investment in 2000 and late 2008, but basically 2009 is when, when we started, we started sampling and that just you know, you, you, you could wow. see the data. And then a few years later, our sampling budget was $20 million. So we went from $800 to $800,000 and then the sampling budget just kept doubling again. And that was far and away the most important aspect of our marketing. I mean, there was nothing else of significant in our marketing for the first 10 years other than giving free kind bars for people to discover them and then word of mouth to do its work. So I get recognized in public a fair amount. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, are you Andrew Yang? And they'd be like, hey, you know, uh, where's my $1,000? That kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and, and so when someone finds out that you're the founder of Kind Snacks, uh, do you feel pressure to be extra nice? Like, do you have to feel like you have to, uh, you know, like make sure not to be a jerk to anyone? <laughs> I feel that pressure even when they don't recognize me because by the time they recognize it's too late, right? But I do... I try to do my best to treat people with dignity and integrity and respect always. I'm a human being. I try to remind people that just because I'm the kind guy, I'm not uh, perfect and I make mistakes too. But I do think that kind made me a better human being. And it's very common if you meet kind team members, they will tell you like, it was fascinating because we used to do surveys and it was fascinating for us to learn how important kind as a culture and as a state of mind was to our team members. Like, they literally felt it made them better parents, better human beings. I do think that that kind has had a role in making me a better person. 
when you're trying to be kind out of fear of being found to be a fake and to not being kind is not the best motivator. But when, when you see the power of kindness, when you see that when you, like we, we did a lot of social experiments where we would try to encourage kindness. And I, I wrote a book called Do the Kind Thing a, a few years ago. And I walked through all the different social experiments we did. But one of the things that we discovered, and obviously this is now very well known, is kindness is magical because it doesn't just make the person that receives the act of kindness have a lift, right, and, and have a better day. It also makes the person doing the kind act feel better about themselves. And eventually it becomes almost like something you are addicted to. Like we used to do these fun games where we needed to try to do kind acts to total strangers. And you realize how how meaningful it is that when I was in the subway and I would spot a lady with her stroller that needed to go up, I was like, ding, 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 ding. That's, that's a big kind of act. <laughs> I, 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 this is a kindness like, opportunity. Let me get in there. <laughs> you know, one of my team members was like, no, but we need to go. You have a talk that you need to do. like, no, this one, this one's worth a hundred points of like happiness. Like I'm going there because it really, you feel good. You feel good when you do something nice for a human being. So that's uh, what I think my team uh, talks about when they say that they feel that kind make, makes them better people, that we're constantly striving to be ambassadors of kindness and everybody makes mistakes, but it's, it's an aspiration. So now you are very concerned like I am about the polarization in the US. Some of the issues that you saw in the Middle East uh, are now very uh, relevant here, unfortunately. And you've founded a campaign, It Starts With Us, to try and give people a way forward that includes compassion, courage, curiosity, uh, that we need to empower people locally to be able to do something positive where they, they live and work and not wait necessarily for, let's say, uh, you know, political figures to, to get their acts together. What, what drove you to invest in this? Because you could obviously you know, do anything under the sun. Yeah, I've been noticing the erosion of American values. For me, American values are the ones that I discovered when I immigrated to America in 1984. And they include creativity, they include resourcefulness, they include respect. Respect is, in my opinion, one of the greatest things America has that we take too much for granted, but that doesn't exist in other places. Like you have legislatures throughout the world where because that respect doesn't exist, they're dysfunctional. You know, rule of law where laws are above individuals. No human is above those laws. All these things and, you know, many others, freedom and, and, and you know, freedom of expression and a real vibrant uh, marketplace of ideas and uh, the curiosity that it takes for us to do that. All these things are under threat today. And I've just been noticing for many years, but just in an accelerated fashion, every, every year it gets worse, how much these values are under threat. And it does terrify me when I start noticing patterns of talking and behavior about the other that we have here in America that remind me of stuff that I've witnessed in the Middle East and in other areas of conflict. Because, you know, I've been, as the son of a Holocaust survivor, I've been my entire life trying to build bridges and trying to study what does it take for a society and for human beings to recognize each other's humanity and 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 learn to respect people that are different from them and united states has always been the place that i draw that inspiration from and it's terrifying that now ground zero for exporting all of these values is now under threat and as i started thinking about this issue you know five or ten years ago but again in accelerated fashion the last several years a few team members and I started doing a lot of work about it. And ultimately, after, you know, literally years of going into, you know, Michigan and Pennsylvania and, and interviewing people on the ground, we realized that actually values are shared far more predominantly than people realize. We think that we are divided in values. That is not true. Yeah. That is absolutely not true. When you talk to the most conservative person and the most progressive person, and you go deep to what matters to them as Americans, helping those left behind unites us all. We all, Americans have this beautiful 
temperament about helping those left behind. Human beings for the most part have, but Americans certainly care about helping those left behind, treating everybody you know, with respect and giving everybody a fair chance and nobody's above the law. And I can give you a bunch of values that are fundamental that we all share. Where we break down is that all of us are not following daily habits that are required for us to really live up our best, best lives and, and approximate to those values. Like, it's fascinating. We did a survey a little bit less than a year ago where we asked how people saw Americans and how they saw themselves. And it's fascinating because we think everybody's judgmental. We're judging them as judgmental, but we think we are not. Same, same with almost every other data point. Like we think we are being, when, when, when you and I are having this conversation about how people need to be more respectful and more curious, your audience is going to nod, but they're going to not think that they're in trouble. They're going to think, you're right. I observe these in others but we don't observe it in ourselves. Every single one of us is part of the problem and part of the solution. Every single one of us is suffering from, you know, social media brainwashing us into thinking we're right because they sell us these algorithms yeah. telling us what we want to hear rather than what we need to hear. And these echo chambers form where we think we have all the answers and we are all knowing. And you know, all sorts of BS is pressed through social media because Section 230 has caused one huge sin to humanity where we don't filter misinformation and disinformation the way we used to, and we don't have the training as human beings to do it. And there's all, all these other reasons, but we are becoming very much more judgmental than we should be, much less forgiving than we should be, much less curious and respectful of other opinions. And this is the beginnings of what can be but the good news is that it's, it, it is very easy to approach more compassion, more courage, and more curiosity in our daily lives. And it's a long way to say what starts with us is giving you tools through our social media channels and other things we're creating for how to live life with, with more of those three Cs. So let me say that having met tens of thousands of Americans in uh, states and regions around the country, I couldn't agree more that most people agree in terms of fundamental values, what they want for themselves, their families, their communities. Most people don't understand is that um, you have the people who share a lot of things. Uh, then you have politicians who have these very distorted incentives because they need to placate the 10% of uh, most extreme voters and, and on both sides because of the party primary system. Then you have a nationalized media network where they separate us into ideological camps. Uh, and then you have social media, like you said, pouring gasoline on the whole thing. And I think social media may, might be the biggest culprit. Yeah, but those three, I agree with you, are the, the there's this aggravating, divisive, polarizing forces because the political parties prey on this sadly because they themselves are held captive to primary voters that are the most passionate, but then also the most extreme. And so, the entire nation is basically held hostage to the most extreme on our on our sides. And these are good people too, by the way, but they are not benefiting from having flexible minds that respect each other. Like I, I find it fascinating. I, I keep meeting incredibly bright people where I would actually agree with some of their positions, but they are so militant in the way they see the other side. Yeah. They turn me off. Yeah, And that's what we need to change. It's not that you need to change your values. It's you need to be less militant about the other because you're going to lose them. When you're so militant, and I'm right and you're wrong, you're going to turn people off and they're going to move away from you. Polarization, as you're describing it, worse than ever. 42% of both Democrats and Republicans see the other side as evil, corrupt, and a threat to the country, which is this militance you're talking about. So I, I've got like a four-step plan to try and remedy it, that I know you're on board with most of it, um, is number one, try and change the incentives so that the political parties aren't quite as beholden to their uh, hyper-partisans on each side. And part of that is creating a, a third-party, positive, unifying, centrist alternatives so that folks have a place to go 
if they're, they don't feel spoken for by the, these two camps. And then some kind of media alternative so that people who want some kind of middle ground independent perspective, and then somehow change these social media mechanics so that you don't have this uh, splintering of the consciousness and different versions of truth. Yeah, well, I'm very aligned and I'm doing work on pretty much all of the spaces you described. And there are some good fledgling efforts, but let's talk for a second about the media one. One of the key questions I have is do we really want it as human beings? Because there are a couple of nascent efforts that are trying to provide more deep, more introspective evaluation of the news of the day. We're, we're looking at this and some of them are encouraging, but the problem is, are we as human beings really, really interesting? That are we as human beings going to lead? Because it's so much easier, Andrew, to be lazy and to not make Americans think harder. It's so much easier for us to not think harder. It requires emotional strength and mental strength to just want to understand the issues. And the media manipulates us and the politicians manipulate us and social media disinforms us, but we are almost willing sheep. Oh, well, we're no, we're more subject to that. That's the path of least resistance. I mean, that's yeah, why the media companies so have figured easier. out it makes more money. Exactly. It's so much easier to just be partisan and just be comforted by hearing what you want to hear rather than yep. what you hear, by using news to affirm your beliefs rather than to inform your beliefs. And it's super dangerous, but it's it remains to be seen whether all of us are going to do a tiny bit of work. And I personally find it much more intellectually stimulating, but it does require a little more work. It's so much easier when the media just tells you somebody that you think is a jerk is a jerk. Like, look how, na and by the way, there are a lot of jerks. There really are a lot of nasty people. I think fundamentally, I believe humans are amazing. But man, there really are some absolute jerks out there. And it's so, you know, energizing when somebody says something. Must have stick it to the jerk, sure, yeah, right? yeah. Right, and I, as the kind guy that I want to be liked by all, sometimes I don't say, you know, this person's just an asshole. And then somebody else says it, and I have this a little bit of like, uh, you're like, yeah, I'm glad that somebody else said it. But ultimately, we're not going to land in a good place as a society if we don't find a way to develop empathy and compassion, even for those we disagree with. That's the hard work. Somebody, a religious person uh, told me these beautiful things is that God equipped us with the ability to be compassionate for those that it's hard to be compassionate towards. Because yeah. the ones that it's easy to be compassionate for, it's like, of course, we're going to be compassionate. We need to develop the ability to find a way to just be patient with those that we're inclined to initially disagree. It does not mean that you give up on your values. It means that you're going to be more effective at advancing those values. So there are definitely some absolute assholes out there in the world. And our system um, is, frankly, rewarding some people with very negative tendencies. Social media absolutely rewards assholes. Like even the opposite, right? If you're a thoughtful, reflective person, you just don't show up in those stupid algorithms. It's pathetic. Yeah, it's so, you know, it's a massive problem. I will say that one experience I have had now dozens, maybe hundreds of times, is I've met someone in person that I had seen something negative about in the media, uh, and I found them to be perfectly fine, uh, positive, sometimes even delightful. And I started thinking, it's like, huh, like maybe I really need to you know, <laughs> sort of withhold judgment based upon these media portrayals um, uh, of folks, because when I met them, it's like I actually like like that person much more more than I thought. So the, it, it it goes both directions. Yeah, but it's also it, that's a very interesting and complex problem. What I find is when I meet these politicians in person, they're much more reasonable and courteous than when sometimes they take positions. And I think it's a multiple set of issues. Part of it is that humans, when they meet, they do develop a little bit more of that conversation. And so I think we just need to meet people that are different from us because a lot of it will be solved that way, but we're now live in places different from the other and we don't get to meet people that are different from us. Um, but also part of the problem is that we as humans have difficulty standing up to power and we it's very hard. It's very hard to have the strength to even respectfully speak up to somebody that did something wrong when they are the leader. And then part of it is that those leaders, when they're with you, they're behaving politely, but when they're 
throw red meat to the most extreme of their constituencies, then they take positions that are not principled. And I think we need to work on all of those, right? Because those politicians need to develop, you know, you also need to develop the incentive structures that you describe. It's essential to help those politicians. So a lot of them are good people, but they are just trying to survive in a political process that has really stupid rules that, that makes it very hard for them to be moderate and compassionate and thoughtful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our system is just rewarding uh, negative behaviors and more ideological stances. Uh, and so then expecting them to go against that grain is tough. You also have achieved something, Andrew, that you have achieved something that is very interesting and special, that where you're able to say what needs to be said. And most times have people give you the benefit of the doubt because they know that you mean well. They know that you're authentic and they know that you are trying to make this a better world. People get that about you. And I think that's a very cool thing you've achieved. Uh, I saw a post that you wrote about how media should not be on Twitter. And the commentary was quite, you had a lot of thousands, tens of thousands of likes, but the comments were, some of them were very nasty. What I asked myself is, is it that the people that take the time to comment are the most extreme? Or is it that you touched a raw nerve on that particular issue. And how do you deal with that? Because I can't do that. I, I maybe as the son of a Holocaust survivor, or maybe I'm just immature, I have not developed the strength to just always speak my mind, even when I'm going to piss off, you know, 50% of the population. I don't think I could be a politician because automatically half of the population from the other parties are going to hate you. How do you deal with, with, those issues. Well, it helps that I've been through versions of it before, Daniel. <laughs> it was like the first time I was like, whoa, I'm getting a lot of uh, hate. And like the, the first time I got a lot of hate, um, it was during the presidential campaign. And I, I'd spoken to a group of Asian Americans uh, who are, you know, frankly, that they were less politically engaged than, than other groups and, and were the most underrepresented uh, in part for that reason. So I said to them, hey, we're a generation away from Asians getting shot by Americans on the basis of their race because uh, like hostility between the US and China. I said this in 2018. Some people then took those comments and put them out online and then people attacked me as being very uh, reactionary and unreasonable. And it really knocked me for a loop for a minute. I was like, oh, you know, like people are really mad at me uh, about this. You know, I, I grappled with it's like, well, did I actually mean what I said? It's like, yeah, I genuinely thought that was going to happen. And I was like speaking to a very specific community and trying to activate them in a particular way. So I've now had that experience or versions of it like dozens of times. <laughs> and, you to tell the story. As someone who's on social media a fair amount as part of my job, you, you know, it's like I see how it screws you up. Um, like, I like to think that it hasn't screwed me up quite as badly as it's, you know, screwed some other people up, but it's certainly a very powerful uh, influence. But also, by the way, you, if they, if the social media commentaries accentuate the negatives because most people probably would not, if you had 100 people in real life listening to you share that very thoughtful commentary, which was provocative, but it was interesting probably 99 would be respectful and not, maybe 100 would not be incendiary, but the in, anonymity and impersonality of these platforms makes people just say things in ways that are so much more negative and also probably inspires people that are much more uh, comfortable with that being the most active. So I think it, there's just a so, whole set of dynamics. You don't think there's personality traits or formative influences in your life that made you better equipped for what you're doing than others? Like, for example, I, I give myself, I've analyzed myself a lot in this front, but I think that I think that one of the things that shaped me the most was being the son of a Holocaust survivor. Like that learning, starting at the age of nine, what my father went through in a concentration camp and also how he was liberated by American soldiers there were a lot of lessons in me, you know, on one side, build bridges at all costs and try to build bridges. On the other side, have the courage to stand up to evil, no matter what, even if you need to fight. Because I, to be clear, if I need to fight for America, if I need to fight for my children, I will fight to the death. I mean, I, I will not walk away because that was one of the most important lessons that my dad uh, instilled upon me. 
But on the other side, I also want to be building bridges. So I don't know that for me, that is the path. For you, what were the formative influences that made you be strong and able to do what you do today? You know, I'm about to give a commencement speech at a high school next week. So I've been reflecting on this a little bit uh, because I wanted to impart lessons to them that actually were relevant to a high school kid. Um, so I was the son of immigrants in upstate New York, one of the only Asian kids. And I was deeply self-conscious, very introverted, uh, got teased and um, marginalized uh, pretty regularly. I'd also skipped a grade. So I was smaller and scrawnier than everyone else. So I was always the odd man out and it pained me deeply um, and so my reaction to that when I grew older was to go to the gym a lot and get mad and drink protein shakes. That's one reason why I'm a kind bar. <laughs> it was, you know, when you have like this arc. I was going to say you played basketball with my kids once and they thought you were really good. So. I, so that was part of it too. Like where it's like, well, as an Asian kid, I started to like basketball and then I'd be like, it would be humiliating if I was a big NBA fan watching it, but I couldn't play a lick. So I was like, well, I better fucking learn how to play. But uh, I think one reason why I'm able to do this, Daniel, is that I was embarrassed and humiliated so much as a kid that like, you know, eventually now I'm like kind of immune to various aspects of it. I also went to a prep school in New Hampshire and then law school. Uh, and I was around people who were political. Uh, you and I met President Obama multiple times, but you and I have met dozens, hundreds of political figures. And in 2016, after Trump won, I thought, well, I should do something to help. So then you say, okay, like, let, let me put myself out there. Um, and, and now uh, I do have a following and I see myself as one of like a relatively small number of people who might be able to avert the catastrophes that you and I see ahead. Um, so now it becomes a very straightforward thing where it's like, of course, I'm going to do it because I'm an American. I'm a parent. Like, I'm like you, uh, you know, I'll fight like mad for this country. Let me ask you a related question. You said that you now see yourself as one of the few people that can help avert this. And you, earlier you talked about how I get things done, right? Like I call it being an actionist rather than seeing the glass half full or half empty. Stop talking about it. It's good. Just get it done. Just do something about it. I definitely have inside me, I don't know if it came from my parents or where it came from. I believe that I can change the world for the better. I definitely have not just that, but also I believe that I have to play a role in, you know, I can't just leave the world the way I found it because it's too dangerous because then we'll see the, the, the space to us. And, but I believe that that is for all human beings. That's when I started One Voice, when it started, starts with us. It's about giving humans agency over their power and with that power, the responsibility that comes with that power to be protagonists in our lives and to take our lives back and to make this a better world, not to wait for others to do it because it's not going to happen. You know, what I have observed is that if you're waiting around for other politicians, or other people to get critical stuff done, it doesn't happen. If you believe in it and you start doing it, then people will join you and do it. But I really firmly believe that all of us have a role to play and a duty to play it. And yet it is true that you and I see that almost, you know, embarrassingly messianic belief that we have the ability to do something. So where did that come from in you? Did it really only come, you know, after you run for president or did you see that before? And why, why what do you think it happens? And do you think all human beings have that power and need to find it? Or honestly, just to be frank, uh, not everybody sees their power to change the world. Uh, I, I think that everyone has incredible capacities that are going underutilized or unutilized 99% of the time because the world doesn't ask that of them. I think it's one reason why I love entrepreneurs so much is that you know entrepreneurs aren't activating 100% of our potential, but we're activating a much higher proportion of it than the average person who's being asked to do very, very little. For me, my confidence was inspired in part by my parents, uh, where my parents drilled into me when I was young if you don't do it, it's because you didn't try hard enough. It's not because you didn't have the ability. I took that to heart. Um, and so I thought, well, if someone else can do something, I can do it too. And that really was informed by my time at this prep school, Phillips Exeter Academy, which was regarded as one of the best high schools in the country. Um, and so I was around a lot of old money patrician uh, New Englanders uh, who you know, were from very, very successful families and the rest of it. 
and going to school with those kids, I did not come away thinking that they were any better than me. <laughs> you know, I, I was like, you know, I was like, I'm, you know, I'm just as good as any of them. And so like, I, I had this sense, it's like, okay, like I should be able to do things if other people can do them. No, I, I wish more people felt like they had greater possibilities. Um, I, I don't want to mislead anyone in the sense that, uh, like you said, uh, you know, if things ever got really terrible for me, I, I had like, you know, a uh, home and a family I could go back to and be like, hey, you know, I need a meal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that. I mean, there are realities uh, that are out there. But right now, most people are not asked to come anywhere near their potential. And if we could activate more people's potential, then that's the path out of this. Something you said that, uh, that spoke to me a lot that I think is really important for all of us to reflect on is you also said, a lot of us don't know that we have it till we're called upon to exercise that leadership. And I do think it's, it's very powerful. You know, there's that person that is walking on the street and all of a sudden is called upon to be a hero, to help somebody that got hurt or to stop somebody that's bad or something. And we never realize that we have that courage inside us till we're called upon to exercise it. And I think it's, the time has come. The time has come for all Americans all of us to unite and do, we're not expecting you to, you know, stop feeding your children and sacrifice. We're, but we, all of us need to join forces in saying enough is enough with this polarization. And this is my way to contribute. I'm gonna to try to practice these habits of compassion towards those that are different from me, courage to try to listen to the other and collaborate with those across lines of difference. And first and foremost, curiosity for me to grow and have the strength to try to do that. If we just start in our daily lives working a little bit at a time on that, we literally, we literally will move, steer the ship back on course because just like it's been off course the last several years, because we're not exercising these daily habits, we can ourselves, it's really literally a part of us. It starts with us to do that. And a lot of the work you're doing is, is going to require people to step up and join and just do a little modicum of something to build that movement of respect that we need to be a part of. Well, I love this because it's something that everyone can take on. It's uh, something everyone can do. Um, you know, we can't control necessarily the actions of the, these people on social media or political leaders, but we can control our own uh, attitudes and habits and our approach to, to people. If this country does make it through this time, Daniel, I have a feeling that you're going to be a big reason why. Uh, you you are a, a natural leader, unifier, uh, and I know after this, uh, there are going to be a lot of people that want to help and support you in anything that you do. So if someone does want to help spread this word uh, and join you, how can they, they best do so? Well, I hope that, uh, Adam, and by the way, I wasn't trying to advertise that they need to join Starts With Us or Daniel Lubetsky or Andrew Yang. They need to find what it is for them. But since you're giving me the opportunity, I do want to encourage everybody to start by just following me on my social media handles at Daniel Lubetsky and following Starts With Us, Starts With .us. But find whatever gives you meaning as you start listening to Andrew's uh, work and to the stuff we share on our channels and others. Find what gives you that energy and what gives you the meaning, but find something. But every one of us needs to be part of this because those that don't approach life with those three C's are not stopping and they will never stop because they have, you know, the, the difference. And I, I shared this a long time ago and people laugh about it, but it really is true. The overwhelming majority of people are thoughtful moderates. And it's only a small percentage of people that are just extremists, let alone violent extremists. But the thing about extremists is that they wake up in the morning and they're like, how am I going to advance my cause? How am I going to advance it? They're very passionate. They advance their cause. Moderates wake up in the morning. They're like, what am I going to have for breakfast? What am I going to eat for breakfast? And that's the disconnect, right? Moderates don't realize their, <laughs> they don't realize their agency. They don't realize their power and responsibility to advance respect and moderations and centrism. And so extremists tend to hold those hostage on guns, on almost Every political issue, I've been doing work recently the last year, on almost every political issue, I believe we could get 70 or 80% of the population to agree on common sense legislation. Not on everything, we're not gonna agree on everything, there's gonna be disagreements, but you can advance, you can make so much progress, but we're held hostage by the extremes 
and we're making no progress. We're completely paralyzed and stagnant. And so we really need to rise up and, 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 and demand and make our voices be more heard and speak to our Congress people and be more present and, and say, look, you know, let's come up with comments and solutions to all of these problems that are ailing us. Well, extreme moderates unite indeed. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. If you had a rational political system, we could come together on a lot of things and also agree that if people are courageous, compassionate, and curious, it's going to be a, a, a better country. Thank you so much, Daniel. You're an awesome friend and champion for humanity. Uh, and, you know, you're helping keeping some of us like a little bit healthier and maybe even a little bit more kind every single day. Appreciate the heck out of you, man. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks to all of your listeners.